Hi there, everyone. My name is Priyag Juthani. I'm actually a second year resident here at Stanford in internal medicine. And I actually did my MD MBA um, at Yale. And today I want to create a new sort of pseudo series about intern 101 basics, about different specialties. And I think um, un internal medicine is unique because we do a little bit of a lot of unique specialties. And I think that also gives us the unique ability to kind of get a taste of everything. And so today I wanted to focus on infectious disease. Regardless of what specialty you're in, infectious disease is a specialty that transcends most, most other specialties. So even if you're getting cardiothoracic surgery, even if you're going into plastic surgery, there are gonna be infections and you have to know how to cover certain types of bugs. And so that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. And everything you're gonna to learn today is something that I think regardless of what kind of intern you are, it's going to help you in any field. And so just going to go over the basics. So um, before I even start, I want you to know most of the information today is going to revolve around this chart. And if you want to get this chart, just type in Wikipedia and then type in um, antibiogram and this will pop up. And this is going to get you through most of intern year, even if you don't memorize it. It tells you what organisms are here on the x-axis at the top. You can see atypicals, anaerobes, gram-negatives, gram-negative bacilli, and then gram-positives. And it tells you the most common antibiotics we use in the hospital and whether or not they're covered uh, for a particular organism. So you might be wondering, hey, do we have atypical coverage? Well, the only three or three antibiotics that usually provide atypical coverage are going to be doxycycline, azithromycin, and levo, right? So they're right here. Um, and then you might be wondering, is Zosin on here, right? So everything I'm going to go over today is in this chart, but I'm going to try to simplify it down to the high yield facts that you need to know for intern year. The second resource that I'm also going to link in the description below is called Wiki Journal Club. As an intern in any specialty, it's important to know the basics, but I think the thing that's really cool is to also know the trials that the basics are based on. So for example, in cardiology, you might know that if you're concerned about a STEMI in a patient, uh, ST uh, segment elevation uh, myocardial infarction, you usually start with aspirin loading someone, right? Similarly, in infectious disease, you might know that you use VANC to cover for MRSA, but where, why exactly is that? And that's because of certain types of trials that we have and obviously empirical data points. And today, a lot of the trials I'm going to refer to are going to be based on the Wikipedia Journal Club. And on this website, it goes through all the biggest trials and numerous specialties and tells you the big takeaways. Um, so I'm going to start this presentation just by going over some important trials because I think they highlight the theme. And then at the end, I'm going to go over some high yield points in infectious disease. And both, I think, will be very useful. So the first one I'm going to go over is called the Stop It trial. Uh, the Stop It trial basically looked at patients with intra-abdominal infections um, and then ultimately saw if we were able to decrease the length of antibiotics after you had achieved source control, right? Um, and the biggest theme that you're going to learn from these trials is that the entire realm of infectious disease is moving toward fewer antibiotics and for a shorter length of time. And it's not just because it's better in, in the mind, hypothetically, it's actually because it's better based on these trials. These trials are showing us that shorter lengths of antibiotics are better than longer lengths, and longer lengths obviously increase the chance of resistance, right? So the stop it trial basically said patients with three to five days of, in, of antibiotics compared to 10 days, maximum of 10 days of antibiotics, although in the control arm, they often stopped it if they had 48 hours of improving symptoms. Um, and that was assuming they had source, and source control. So if you actually ended up having like an abscess in the abdomen and you actually drained the abscess, then you actually had source control. And then ultimately after source control, they did three to five days of antibiotics or up to 10 days of antibiotics. And what they found is that there was no difference between the groups in terms of primary outcome of surgical site infection or recurrent intra-abdominal infection or death at 30 days. So it's a non-inferiority study, but all it was saying is three to five days of antibiotics is all you need for intra-abdominal infections, assuming you have source control. Obviously you need source control because if you do not have source control, none of these results apply. The second really important trial that I want to go over is the Marino trial. And the Marino trial is really interesting because in the hospital, you may hear a lot about this thing called ESBL um, E. coli, end stage beta lactamase E. coli. And what does that mean? It's generally a very vague term, but in my head, I take it to mean that any E. coli that's resistant to third generation cephalosporins like ceftriaxone. ESBL is a very unique type of bug because it means that there obviously is some level of resistance. So what antibiotics should we pick for them? Oftentimes people think broad spectrum antibiotic will work for E. coli, but believe it or not, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics like Zosin do not work 
for ESBL. And so this is the trial that this came from. So you'll see that 378 patients with E. coli or Klebsiella pneumonia that's susceptible to Zosin and Meropenem, but not ceftriaxone, right? Not ceftriaxone. So that means ESBL. That's end-stage beta-lactamase. They have end-stage beta-lactamase, which allows them to be resistant to third-generation cephalosporins. And you'll see that there was actually a three-fold higher 30-day mortality in the Zosin group. So whenever someone has evidence of ESBL, uh, so if you have gram-negative bacteremia and you have resistance to ceftriaxone, believe it or not, you actually want to consider giving the carbapenems, miropenem, ertapenem. And that's really good because one, clearly there's higher mortality with Zosin. So Zosin is one of those antibiotics that's a huge broad spectrum antibiotic, right? Like if you go to, if you go here, you can see that Zosin, which is right here, it covers gram positives. It actually covers anaerobes and it even covers gram negatives. So people think that it covers E. coli, but it actually does not cover ESBL. So for that reason, this is actually one of the few things that if you suspect ESBL or someone has a history of um, uh, organisms that are resistant to such traction, you might want to consider like meropenem or carbapenem. The next trial I want to go over is the POET trial. This is called the Partial Oral Treatment of Endocarditis. Endocarditis is a life-threatening infection of the inside of your heart, the endocardium, and it often, often used to take six weeks of IV antibiotics to treat. However, this trial came out recently, and it actually found that after 10 days of IV antibiotics, they then had one arm which got an oral antibiotic regimen and another arm that got IV. And they found that the oral antibiotic regimen was non-inferior to the IV only. That's not to say your institution should be treating everyone with oral, right? These are just the biggest studies that are suggesting oral over IV, shorter, shorter lengths of antibiotic treatment uh, over longer lengths. Um, and I think the more important part is you have to look into the nuances of this study a little bit, because you'll see that here there was 0% um, of individuals with MRSA. Obviously, if you have MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, I would probably favor IV uh, over PO, just because PO bank is not going to be as helpful compared to IV bank. And then more importantly, um, there is only a handful of PO agents that are good against MRSA. Um, and so this is, again, just one trial, but trying to show you the general theme, which is shorter length of antibiotics, and more importantly, oral over IV. Um, in this case, I want you to know that every patient with endocarditis in this trial had at least 10 days of IV antibiotics, right? So it's not just oral all the way. Um, it's just a good trial to look into. It's a good trial to mention to your ID colleagues. And oftentimes, they might still require six weeks of IV antibiotics, because again, it's, this is a trial. It applies to populations. It doesn't apply to individuals. The last one I want to go over is the OVIVA trial. Um, this is, again, the same thing. Uh, they actually, uh, instead of endocarditis, they're looking at bone and joint infections. And so assuming you have source control, they actually then uh, um, followed up with IV antibiotics versus PO antibiotics for um, uh, bone and joint infections. And even in this one, they found that um, uh, oral antibiotics were not inferior to IV, IV antibiotics. You don't have to know the nuances of all, of all of these trials. I think the important part is that you know that they exist and you actually like talk to your ID colleagues about them because they often know way more. But at the at the very heart, if you know that these exist, you can at least bring them up, all right? Now let's go over one of the most high yield things in infectious disease, which is MRSA and MSSA bacteremia. This is like a hallmark infectious disease thing because whenever you have a patient and they start growing staph aureus, it is automatically an ID consult, whether or not it's MSSA, methicillin susceptible, or if it's MRSA, methicillin resistant, because multiple studies have shown that in, uh, that just consulting ID right away improves outcomes because MRSA bacteremia and MSSA bacteremia can be very lethal. And then there's a handful of things that you should do. Um, if there's nothing else you take away from this presentation, I would memorize this slide because just having and knowing this can save lives because, um, and, and you as a general doctor, uh, should should know this. I, I genuinely believe that. The second thing is when people start growing this, once you consult ID, I would start broad spectrum antibiotics. Specifically, if you don't know if it's MSSA or MRSA, um, I would just start with vancomycin because vancomycin is going to hit your MRSA. And then if it eventually becomes comes back as MSSA, then you can narrow your antibiotics. And MSSA uh, antibiotics, methicillin susceptible, usually means that you can use cefazolin, nafcillin, and oxalicillin. But um, if you're not positive, again, just go with the Wavank. If you can't do vancomycin for whatever reason, maybe they have a history of red man syndrome, you can often consider daptomycin. Daptomycin, unfortunately, requires you to uh, continue to monitor CK levels uh, because you have an increased risk of 
uh, rhabdomyolysis. And then um, if you do know it's MSSA, you should not necessarily always just use vancomycin because vancomycin has been shown to be inferior to just beta-lactams for MSSA. Um, and so if you know it's MSSA, you're confident it's MSSA, I would just go with cefazolin or nafcillin. The next thing you want to do whenever someone is growing staph aureus, staph aureus is often a bug that's found on our skin. So you want to think about how did they get this infection? Chances are if they have any lines in and those lines look infected, if they have IVs in, if they have a central line, in, if they have a peripheral catheter in, I would look into them, and if they look infected at all, I would take them out because that might be a source. The second thing is, do they have a history of IV drug use? That's often another source, right? Um, and then the next question to ask is, do they have any hardware in their body at all? So maybe they have a new joint that was replaced. Maybe they have a previous um, spinal surgery where they had hardware replaced. Hardware can get very infected very fast, and they often can be the source. And might have, that hardware might need to come out. So that's another question to ask. You want to pull blood cultures again. So obviously, if you have MSSA and MRSSA, you're probably growing them in your blood. So if you see that it came back as growing that, you should get another set of blood cultures because you need to see when the blood cultures clear. Because if blood cultures are not clearing, that means you're not treating the bacteremia properly. And that often means that you need to either broaden your coverage or you need to treat for a longer period of time. Because if your blood cultures do not clear right away, that would imply that you have complicated um, MRSA bacteremia or MSSA bacteremia, which would actually mean that you have four weeks of antibiotics compared to two weeks. Another thing you should always do is get a TTE, which I don't have here. You need to get a, uh, an echocardiogram because oftentimes you want to rule out endocarditis um, as a cause of the bacteremia. Uh, the next thing I wanted to kind of bring up here is MSSA versus MRSA uh, coverage. MSSA means methicillin susceptible uh, staph aureus. So whenever you have that, that means that you just have pretty good old staph aureus. And oftentimes that can just be treated with nafcillin, but usually what people use is um, cefazolin. And that's usually because it's easier dosing two grams Q8 hours. But nafcillin people often use because if you're suspecting any sort of um, CNS pathology, if you think the MSSA is going to the brain, nafcillin often has better CNS penetration. Oxacillin, I haven't seen it used nearly as much, but I just put it up here because it is something that covers MSSA. For MRSA, whenever you're worried about MRSA systemic infection, there's only two IV meds usually, vancomycin and daptomycin. And then there's actually three PLO meds that actually cover MRSA, which people may not know about. And this would reduce major brownie points just knowing the PLO meds that cover MRSA, and that's Bactrim the linazolid, and then the last one is doxycycline. For Bactrim, you actually need to make sure you monitor kidney function because you can get hyperkalemia. Uh, with linazolid, you actually need to man monitor for peripheral neuropathies. You also need to monitor for pancytopenia. And for doxycycline, you often tell the patient to take doxy at night because it can cause um, worsening GERD-like symptoms and then photosensitivity as well. So we've got to wear a cap. And then the last thing I want to end on, because almost all of infectious disease revolves around nuances, and there's a big nuance with MRSA, MSSA, and then of course, Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is a very pathogenic bug, and oftentimes a lot of, a lot of antibiotics don't cover Pseudomonas. The reason why you should be worried about Pseudomonas is oftentimes if someone's been hospitalized, they have a history of Pseudomonas in the past, there's only one big class of antibiotics that cover pseudomonas orally, oral antibiotics that cover pseudomonas. So if you want pseudomonal coverage and you want an oral pseudomonal coverage, you want a fluoroquinolone. Then I love this tweet from um, Aaron Goodman. He's a great doctor on Twitter who always tweets out some great pearls. Um, there's only a handful of drugs that cover pseudomonas. So um, cefepime is basically going to cover pseudomonas. And then it also has the same thing as ceftriaxone. Zosin is the same thing as cefepime plus anaerobic coverage. So if you're worried about a GI bug and you want pseudomonal coverage, then Zosin is a good one. And this is often why we use Vanczosin, right? When we use Vanczosin for a lot of people, very broad spectrum, Vanc covers for MRSA and then Zosin covers for gram negatives and it covers anaerobes. So you get very broad spectrum coverage. You don't have atypical coverage. And so sometimes people often do Vanczosin and then Doxy if you want atypical coverage, but you get a lot of coverage with the Vanczosin. But believe it or not, this is often why um, Zosin is cefepime plus anaerobic coverage. And then if you want Miro, that's Zosin plus ESBL, right? Because we talked about carbapenems through the Marino trial are shown to cover ESBL while Zosin is not. And then erdapenem is actually does not cover for pseudomonas, but it does cover for ESBL. So erdapenem is the same as Miropenem without pseudomonas. So I hope this was a helpful like 100 Foot view of ID. I think it's really helpful to know these big facts. I think they've really helped me. And if you like this video, please drop a like, comment, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you all in the next one.
Peace.